watching, listening again, thank you. Um, we hope that you're blessed with this, uh, after this morning's uh, message. I've titled today's message, A Song from the Heart. So in the chapter we're going to be covering today, um, again, let me remind you of something I mentioned last week. These ne- chapters 21 to 24 is, um, isn't in chronological order as the other chapters, 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel, have been. These are stories that the author collected, put together at the end. I talked about that a little last week, but, um, but keep that in mind um, if it seems like as we go through this passage that it seems out of place. So 2 Samuel chapter 22. And as you turn there, um, I want just want to mention a few things also. Um, this vivid, spontaneous poem of thanksgiving records how David felt after the Lord helped him to defeat his enemies. Now, some have said that he wrote this song after Saul had been killed and he became king, um, but I'm not sure I agree with that, and let me tell you why. See, when we covered the conflict between David and Saul in 1 Samuel, it doesn't appear that David ever considered or he never really treated Saul as an enemy. I actually see the opposite, evidence of the opposite. Saul saw David as the enemy. So I'm inclined to believe that that he probably wrote this song, this poem, after God made his covenant with him in 2 Samuel chapter 7 and gave him the victories recorded in chapters 8 and 10. This would then mean that he wrote this uh, before his sin with Bathsheba. And the reason I believe this also is because there's no way he could have written verses 20 through, th- through 27 after that sad episode. The other thing I wanted to mention about chapter 22 is that this song is pretty much identical to the one seen in Psalm 18, but with some slight differences. It's likely that this one here was the original version, but when the song was, ad- the song was adapted to, for corporate worship, David wrote this new opening in Psalm 18.1, I love you, Lord, my strength. The Hebrew word uh, used for love here means a deep and fervent love, not just a passing emotion. And the other difference is that he also deleted the the last line from verse 3 of this chapter that we're going to be reading. Um, Besides that, the other differences aren't really that significant and won't deter us from really grasping the glorious message of this song of praise. So before we really uh, dig into God's word this morning, let's pray and ask for him to speak to us this morning. Lord, Heavenly Father, as Pastor Isaac mentioned, we are so thankful that you've brought us here, that we have... um, the mouth to sing these beautiful songs to you, Lord, that we have the ears to hear them, we have the heart to feel them, and the mind to understand them, Lord. Lord, you have a glorious and wonderful plan for each and every one of us, and I know that if you haven't revealed it yet, you will, and you will, and for many, you will confirm that through this message and so I pray that you will reveal that you will show them clearly that in spite of maybe some of the pain they're going through now the the heartache the the suffering Lord that you are preparing them for something bigger something greater something more wonderful Lord so now as we continue in this time of of worship Lord in this time of of 
seeking you and, and dedicating this time to you. Lord, we ask that you just help us to fully uh, to d- keep away those distractions, Lord, and fill us with your Holy Spirit, Lord. I want to hear from you now. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, amen. All right. Second Samuel chapter 22, verse 1. The Word of God says, David spoke the words of this song to the Lord. On the day the Lord rescued him from the grasp of all his enemies and from the grasp of Saul, he said, The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God, my rock, where I seek refuge. My shield, the horn of my salvation. My stronghold, my refuge, and my savior. You save me from violence. I called to the Lord who is worthy of praise, and I was saved from my enemies. From the waves of death, for the waves of death engulfed me. The torrents of destruction terrified me. The ropes of Sheol entangled me. The snares of death confronted me. I called to the Lord in my distress. I called to my God from his temple. From his temple, he heard my voice, and my cry for help reached his ears. Then the earth shook and quaked. The foundations of the heavens trembled. They shook because he burned with anger. Smoke rose from his nostrils, and consuming fire came from his mouth. Coals were set ablaze by it. He bent the heavens and came down, total darkness beneath his feet. He rode on a cherub and flew, soaring on the wings of the wind. He made darkness a canopy around him, a gathering of water and thick clouds. From the radiance of his presence, blazing coals were ignited. The Lord thundered from heaven. The Most High made his voice heard. He shot arrows and scattered them. He hurled lightning bolts and routed them. The depths of the sea became visible. The foundations of the world were exposed at the rebuke of the Lord, at the blast of his breath of his nostrils. He reached down from on high and took hold of me. He pulled me out of, out of deep water. He rescued me from, pow- from my powerful enemy and from those who hated me, for they were too strong for me. They confronted me on the day of my com- calamity. But the Lord was my support. He brought me out to a spacious place. He rescued me because he delighted in me. The author of this book, this chapter, begins by emphasizing that with the words of this song, David expressed to the Lord his praise and his thankfulness for delivering him from the grasp of his enemies and from keeping away from the murderous murderous clutches of Saul. And then he tells us what those words were. David starts this song by acknowledging the greatness of God with a series of metaphors series of images he uses rock fortress deliverer shield horn of salvation stronghold refuge and savior the point being that uh, everything god has done in the past and his promises for the future are predicated on who he is These descriptions of the Lord are especially appropriate in light of the setting of the song. That of flight, conflict, and victory. I should also point out that deliverer is a key word in this song, in this poem. And it it carries with it the meanings of drawing out of danger, snatching away, taking away, allowing to escape. Now, let me show you, uh, give you some examples of how David experienced 
the Lord's deliverance. When he wrote that God, um, and he wrote this, God had delivered David from Goliath. He had delivered him from Saul. He had delivered him from backsliding. He had delivered him from Israel's enemies. Nevertheless, in verses 5 through 6, he says that in those moments, when he was experiencing, when he felt the terror of, of, of death, when he felt like he was about to die, in the following verse, he says that God heard his voice and his cries and wonderfully responded to his prayers from his temple in heaven. Let me ask you, what do you do when you're drowning in a flood of opposition? When you're drowning in a flood of emotions that you feel like this is the end. I, I can't go any further. I, you know, I, I feel like I'm about to die. Do you call on the Lord and trust him to help you in that time of need? Just as David was a man of prayer who depended on the Lord for wisdom, strength, and deliverance, in those times you must as well. And just like the Lord never failed him, he won't fail you either. Let me remind you what it says in James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. And there it says, Consider it great joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you experience various trials, because you know that the, that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its full effect so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. You see, God waited all those years to deliver, to deliver David and then to put him on the throne because he was building for himself. He was building himself a leader. A leader who had gone through trials, sufferings, and battles. So you see, he may be doing the same with you. In order to prepare you for something even greater, something bigger, that you can't even begin to imagine. David experienced all this because the Lord had his own timetable. Now, this David didn't understand. He didn't get, he didn't get it at the time, but... God's ways were bigger than his. He didn't see what God was planning. He, didn't, he wasn't seeing what God had in store. So, let me just say this. You can trust and believe that his plan and purpose for you is coming. If you're suffering, if you're going through a hard time, trials and whether it's illness or whether it's emotional or um, something really difficult. The Lord has a plan for you and a purpose for you, and it's coming. Just be patient. Uh, for those of you who are suffering, let me tell you this again. The best is yet to come. Well, when the Lord answered his cries and delivered him from Saul and his enemies of, uh, and the enemies of the people of God, he describes it like a great thunderstorm being released over the land. There, David says that God's anger had caused an earthquake, which was then followed by fire and smoke. Against the background of the black sky, the Lord swooped down on a cloud propelled by the cherubim. And the cherubim is, is our angels. He then says in verses 14 through 16 that God's arrows were like lightning bolts, his voice like thunder, and the winds like the angry breath of his nostrils. After seeing God shake heaven and earth on behalf of David, 
He shook the cosmos, not just the earth, but the heavens. His enemies gave up and were completely routed. This was the reason David never really considered himself a great military commander. Rather, he simply thought of himself as God's servant who believed and trusted that the Lord would win the victory, which is why he gave all the glory to God. Well, let's move on now to the next section of this song, beginning in verse 21. 2 Samuel chapter 22, verse 21. The Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness. He repaid me according to the cleanness of my hands. For I had kept the ways of the Lord and have not turned from my God to wickedness. Indeed, I let all his ordinance guide me. I have not disregarded his statues. I was blameless before him and kept myself from my iniquity. So the Lord repaid me according to to my righteousness, according to my cleanness, cleanness of his sight. With the faithful, you prove yourself faithful. With the blameless, you prove yourself blameless. With the pure, you prove yourself pure. But with the crooked, you prove yourself shrewd. You rescue and oppress people, but your eyes are set against the proud. You humble them. Lord, you are my lamp. The Lord illuminates my darkness. With you, I can attack a barricade. And with my God, I can leap over a wall. God, his, per his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is pure. He is a shield to all who take refuge in him. In this section I just read, uh, David, uh, David's song, his lyrics shift from God's deliverance to his blessings on him, on David. Now, if you were just to isolate verses 21 to 25 from the rest of the song, with all the eyes and me's in there, it would seem as if David was bragging about himself. But uh, this isn't the case at all. If you read closely, David is really praising the Lord for enabling him to live a blameless life in, in, in dangerous and uncomfortable situations. See, prior to his sin with Bathsheba, all he did and all he ever wanted to do was to please the Lord. Remember, he was a man after God's own heart. He wanted to please the Lord, obey his law, and trust his promises. We must also be careful not to assume that those verses, verses 21 to 25, that David is saying that his salvation was the result of all the works that he did. What he's actually saying here is that the benefits of God are often obtained in this life by faithful perseverance in godliness. So even when he felt as if, this, as if his life was about to end, David kept God's ways, his ordinances and statues, and kept his, himself from sin. And as a result, the Lord rewarded him for his righteousness. And according, and according to the clean, cleanness, cleanness of David's hands in God's, sight, in God's sight. Having personally witnessed what God can do. David then testifies in verses 26 through 28 that God justly deals with people according to their character. With the faithful, blameless, and pure, God proves himself to be the same way. On the other hand, the crooked, that is, those who insist in trying to manipulate God, well, he will eventually prove that he has always been one step ahead of them. 
he also goes on to affirm that God, that it's God who has and will rescue an oppressed people. The wicked, however, because of their pride, can only expect a piece of humble pie. Again, what David wants us to understand is that God is always faithful to his character and his covenant. Knowing the character of God is essential to knowing and doing the will of God and pleasing his heart. David knew God's covenant, so he understood what God expected of him. See, the character of God and the covenant of God are the foundations for the promises of God. If we, as Christians, ignore his character and covenant, we'll never be successful in claiming his promises, in believing in his promises, grabbing hold of them. David then ends this particular part of the song by basically saying that God is his lamp who illuminates his darkness and helps him to walk in the light of life. Also by him, David could be in battle and break through the enemy's barricade and leap over their wall. What he said here in verse 30 tells us that David knew the principle of Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, long before Paul even wrote the words. And there Paul said, Be strengthened by the Lord and by his vast strength. So again, David understood this principle way back then. See, God has a, a, a resource of power, his might, that he makes available to us by faith. This means that we don't have to be strong in our might, but we can be strong in his might. In verse 30, 31, we're told that God's way is perfect. And he made David's way perfect because David trusted in him. See, God shielded David in battle because he completely relied on the flawless word of God. Now, in the last section of the song we're about to read, David turned once more to the attributes of the Lord. So let's go to verse 32 and then read that. And as I said, I'll be explaining a little more I'll get a little bit more into this passage. Um, 2 Samuel chapter 22, verse 32. I'll be reading all the way to the end. For who is God besides the Lord? And who is rock? And who is a rock? Only our God. God is my strong refuge. He makes my way perfect. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer and sets me securely on the heights. He trains my hands for war. My arms can bend a bow of bronze. You have given me the shield of your salvation. Your help ex ex exalts me. You make a, special, a spacious place beneath me for my steps. And my ankles do not give way. I pursue my enemies and destroy them. I do not turn back until they are wiped out. I wipe them out and crush them, and they do not rise. They fall beneath my feet. You have clothed me with strength for battle. You subdue my adversaries beneath me. You have made my enemies retreat before me. I annihilate those who hate me. They look, but there's... There is no one to save them. They look to the Lord, but he does not answer them. I pulverize them like dust of the earth. I crush them and trample them like mud in the streets. You have freed me from the feuds among my people. You have preserved me as head of nations, 
a people I had not known serve me. Foreigners submit to me, cringing. As soon as they hear, they obey me. Foreigners lose heart and come trembling from their fortifications. The Lord lives. Blessed be my rock. God, the rock of my salvation, is exalted. God, he grants me vengeance and casts down the peoples under me. He frees me from my enemies. You exalt me above my adversaries. You rescue me from violent men. Therefore, I will give thanks to you among the nations, Lord. I will sing praises about your name. He is a tower of salvation, for he is king. He shows loyalty to his anointed, to David and his descendants forever. Here, once again, David speaks about God's attributes, but now he connects them to specific ways in which God has worked and would work on his behalf. In verses 31 and 35, God described first, God is described first as a strengthener, one who is a shield, a rock, a refuge, one who gives speed and power to his servants. Just as Paul said in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, David's body belonged to the Lord. And so God used his arms, feet, and hands to overcome the enemy. David was a gifted warrior. But it was the anointing power of the Lord that enabled him to succeed on the battlefield. Like a fleet footed deer. He could reach the heights. Even, he says, his ankles didn't turn. God made David's arms strong enough to bend a bow of bronze and shoot arrows with great power. See, through the Lord, David was able to, pers to pursue and destroy his enemies so they could not rise again. Next, David uh, talks about how the Lord supported him during his victories against his enemies. In verse 42, he says that they call called out to God. His enemies called out to God, but he wouldn't answer them. Now, there may be some who might cringe as you read David's description of his victories in verses 38 through 46. But you must remember that he was fighting the Lord's battles. If these nations had defeated and destroyed and completely annihilated Israel, what do you think would have happened to God's great plan of salvation? He would have, God just would have been seen or known as just another worthless idol. He wouldn't have been seen as an all powerful, all knowing God. And we wouldn't have a Bible. And we wouldn't have a Savior. See, in rebelling against the Lord and worshiping idols, these pagan nations knew, they knew what they were doing was sinful. And so they were without excuse. Yet the Lord was patient with them for many years. And still, throughout that time, they ignored his grace so that's why God enabled David to pursue his enemies when they tried to get away. He defeated them, crushed them, and pulverized them to the dirt. And he says in verse 32 that they became like mud in the streets. He then says in verses 44 through 46, the Lord also made him head of nations. The king recognized that all the supposed obedience from foreign leaders and peoples might not be sincere. Human fortresses were no match for the eternal God, who is a fortress to those who trust in him. And then finally, David said that the Lord was his savior in verses 47 through 51. With a shout of praise, David proclaimed 
in verse 47, the Lord lives. This was his bold witness to the people he defeated and their dead idol, that their dead idols couldn't save them or protect them. Only Jehovah, the God of Israel, is the true and living God. And David's victories and his enthronement proved that God was with him. And David closes his song with high and holy praise for the Lord, the God of Israel, for choosing him to be king. He acknowledged that all God's benefits of the past were just tokens of his promised blessings on both David and his descendants, blessings which will endure forever. Keep in mind also here that David was always careful not to exalt himself, but to exalt the Lord. And because he exalted the Lord, the Lord exalted him. Ladies and gentlemen, if we magnify our own name or our own deeds, we will sin. But if the Lord magnifies us, we can bring glory to his name. In this psalm, you can see what it was that thrilled the heart of David. He saw God and mentioned him at least 19 times. He saw God in the affairs of life, both the happy occasions and in the storms that came. He saw God's purpose in his life in the nations, in the nation of Israel, and rejoiced to be a part of it. But most exciting of all, in spite of all the troubles that David had experienced, he still saw the gentle hand of God molding his life and accomplishing his purposes. The enlarged troubles enlarged David and prepared him to take enlarged steps. In the enlarged place God had prepared for him. That can be your experience as well. You just trust in him, obey in him, obey him and believe in Jesus. Now, it's important to point out that Paul quoted verse 50. In Romans chapter 15, verse 9, as part of the wrap-up of his admonition to believers in the churches of Rome, that they receive one another and stop judging one another. There, the Gentile believers in Rome were enjoying their freedom in Christ, while many of the Jewish believers were still in bondage to the law of Moses. Paul points out that Christ came to minister to both Jews and Gentiles by fulfilling God's promises to the Jews and dying for both Jews and Gentiles. The implication was that from the beginning of the nation, when God called Abraham and Sarah, the Lord had in mind to include the Gentiles in his gracious plan of salvation. The sequence then in Romans Chapter 15, 8 through 12, is especially significant. There, Paul tells us that Jesus confirmed the promises made to Israel, and Israel brought the message of salvation to the Gentiles. Both believing Jews and Gentiles, as one spiritual body, now praise the Lord together. And all the nations hear the good news of the gospel. And when Jesus returns, he will reign over both Jews and Gentiles in his glorious kingdom. See, from the very beginning, it was God's plan that the nation of Israel be his vehicle for bringing salvation to the lot to a lost world. Salvation is of the Lord, says Jonah, it says Jonah in Jonah chapter 2 verse 9. And salvation is of the Jews, said John, it says in John chapter 4, verse 22. Thus, 
ladies and gentlemen, the, the Gentiles owe a great debt to the Jews and Gentile Christians ought to pay that debt. And you know how you can pay that debt as a Gentile Christian? You can show, their, you can show your appreciation to Israel by praying for their salvation and for the peace of Jerusalem. Lovingly witness to them as God gives you the opportunity. And when necessary, when you're able to share your material blessings with them as well. Now, several things as I went through this passage and put it together, several things impressed, uh, impressed me as I reflected on this beautiful song. First, I see that David's successes are ultimately God's doing. And some of these things you've, I, I'm reiterating, but now I'm kind of summing it up. As David reflects on his rise to the throne, he understands that his rise to power and his prominence was due to divine grace. He recalls the peril he was in and, in the, de and, and the death that seemed inevitable and unavoidable. And he praises God as his rescuer, his refuge, his source of strength and success. It's not as though David did nothing and waited for God to do everything. Rather, in spite of all, all that David did, he knew it was God who preserved his life and God who promoted him to be the king of Israel. David exemplifies true humility here. So let us learn from him. If a man of his statue and spiritual intensity can give God the glory, certainly we should as well. As Paul put it in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7, For who makes you superior? What do you have that you didn't receive? If, in fact, you did receive it, why do you boast as if you hadn't received it? We should give God the glory all the time for everything. Second, I see that God, that David's successes seem to be occasioned by his adversities and afflictions many of which were brought about by his enemies. David praises God for his salvation. Often this salvation was in the physical realm. God, see, God saved David's life. When you look at the Gospels, you find the same thing. The ultimate salvation is the salvation which rescues us from eternal condemnation. And brings about the forgiveness of our sins through the blood of Jesus Christ. Assuring us of eternal life. But throughout the gospel, our Lord is seen saving people in a very broad sense. Which only strengthens his claim to be a greater savior than this. The lesson we are to learn is that God is our Savior in many ways. The grace of which is the salvation he provided, again, through the shedding of the blood of Jesus Christ. The first and foremost important way we can experience God's salvation is by trusting, is by receiving the free gift of salvation from the guilt and penalty of our sins, by trusting in the sacrificial death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then, day by day, you must look to him as your deliverer, your fortress, your refuge, in whose care and keeping you are eternally secure. Third, God's rescue of righteousness is achieved 
by the exercise of God's wrath. David speaks of his danger as coming from those who are his foes, those who seek his death. When God is described as he comes to David's rescue, he comes with all of nature at his bidding. He rides, as it were, on the wings of the wind. He employs thunder and lightning and the earthquakes. All this is the manifestation of God's anger towards those sinners who oppose him by opposing his chosen king. God rescues his servants by defeating and destroying the enemies of his servant. Also notice that David doesn't speak of God's salvation apart from God's condemnation. God saves David by destroying his enemies. There's nothing more frightening than finding yourself in opposition to a holy and righteous God. There's nothing more terrifying than, the coming, than coming to the realization that it's too late. That you have not set yourself, that you have set yourself against God's anointed one, God's son. If that was true for the enemies of David, think about how, how it will be like for those who have rejected Jesus Christ, the son of David, and the son of God. There is no greater evil than to rebel against God by rejecting his son. Fourthly, there's certainly a greater, there's certainly one greater than David spoken of here in her text. And when we read Psalm 22, not chapter 22 here, but Psalm 22, we recognize that while this psalm was written by David, who was suffering at the hands of his enemies, there were things here, there are things here that can speak of only Christ, David's offspring. Well, the same is true of Psalm 18, or as, we, as I mentioned in the beginning, this song in chapter 22. In the ultimate sense, it is the son of David, Jesus Christ, who is being described. Jesus Christ. God's son was rejected by wicked men who put him to death. It's Jesus whom God rescued from the dead by raising him from the dead. It is the enemies of our Lord whom the Father will destroy when he sends his son back to the earth again. David's song of salvation is just that. A psalm which looks forward to a time when the eternal throne will be established on the earth, and when the enemies of our Lord will be pulverized, while those who trust in him will be saved. What a glorious day that will be. The joy of his salvation is equaled by the terror of his righteous wrath. Fifth, if God is our refuge, then there is no need to fear See, brothers and sisters in Christ, there is nothing in, in this world to compare with the safety and security of you as a believer, as a born-again Christian. We're told in Deuteronomy chapter 3, verse 6, Be strong and courageous. Don't be terrified or afraid of them. For the Lord your God is one who will go with you. He will not leave you or abandon you. Now, there are many more passages that speak on fear and many more that speak on how the Lord is with the saint, is with the believer. I think that if I would have, if I was to mention them all here, I'd, you know, I'd be going an extra 20, 30 minutes, but there are several found um, in the Bible that speak on that, speak on fear. But the point I want to make is that the one who has the one who has come to know and trust in Jesus Christ as savior well you have nothing 
to fear. You have nothing to fear at all. There is no need for you to fear God's judgment for your punishment has been borne by our Savior. There is no need to fear for your needs for He has promised to take care of you. There is no need to fear any circumstance of life for He is for you. So you see, may this confidence be yours as you trust in God's salvation, Jesus Christ. Let me read to you one more passage as I close. And it's found in, again, Romans chapter. It's found in Romans, and I'll be reading in Romans chapter 8 if you want to go there. Romans chapter 8, verse 31. There Paul says, What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He did not even spare his own son, but offered him up for us all. How will he not also with him grant us everything? Who can bring an accusation against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Jesus Christ is the one who died, but even more has been raised. He also is at the right hand of God. And intercedes for us. Who can separate us from the love of Christ? Can affliction or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, because of you, we are being put to death all day long. We are counted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor heights, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. How beautiful and amazing that promise is. For those that have trusted in Jesus Christ. So now I want to take a moment to speak to those who haven't trusted in Jesus Christ. Haven't trust, made, their, made Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior. Who have been hanging on the fence. Not sure whether to surrender your lives or not. Or maybe you have walked away from the Lord and you realize that the world isn't giving you or hasn't given you what the Lord has in the past. Well, for those of you who if you've either walked away from the Lord, have backslidden, or have never trusted in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you want to have that security of knowing that when you die, when you breathe your last breath, that you will be eternally with the Lord. That he will welcome you into his home as an adopted child. And I want to invite you to the cross before Jesus Christ to lay your sins before him. And if that's you, I want you to close your eyes and bow your head and wherever you're at, Pray this with all your heart. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. And I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. I now turn from my sins and confess you as my personal Lord and Savior. I accept your forgiveness. Thank you for saving me. Now fill me with the Holy Spirit so that he may help guide me in my new born again life. In your name. Amen.
you prayed that, you're watching online or watching this live or watching it later on, um, contact us. We want to hear from you. There's a contact. Uh, our contact information is there on YouTube or it's also on our website. Uh, there should be a link in the, in the description box. But uh, let us know that you prayed that prayer and that way we can maybe help you in your next steps. Maybe if you're looking for a church in your local area or you just need a Bible, you know, we can, we can help you with that. Um, and if you're here locally, uh, we want to invite you here to Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel where you'll be taught the Word of God and where you're going to, I believe, grow as a believer, as a Christian, as a child of God. For those of you watching online, I'm going to go ahead and conclude uh, our today's service. Um, I hope that you'll be able to join us next week as we, again, only have about a week, one week or two of finishing Second Samuel. If you've been with us the entire journey, um, we're almost there. We're almost at the end. So uh, just keep holding on. Um, thank you again for joining us. Have a great week. Be blessed. We love you. Bye. Thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope we were blessed by Pastor Angel's message this morning. For more information about Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, such as our service time or how to get connected, please visit our website at fvccelp.com. If the Lord is leading you to give to the ministry of Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, there's a PayPal link in the video description below. Once again, thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope to see you again soon.